Hi, and thanks for joining Sapelo Nerds, a coastal science podcast. I'm your host, Corinne. And I'm your host, Brittany. And we work at the National Estuarine Research Reserve, or NEAR, on Sapelo Island, a Georgia barrier island. In today's episode, Wetlands at Work, we are going to discuss ecosystem services, why we need wetlands, and what you can do for your estuary. So let's start with the basics. What makes a wetland a wetland? Well, that's a good question, Corinne. Any listeners who might still be a little confused after this podcast about what qualifies as a wetland should check out our YouTube page for our upcoming video, What is a Wetland?, where we will discuss what qualifies as a wetland, why wetland habitat is so special, and how ephemeral or temporary wetlands can help your yard. And while you're there, be sure to check out our other videos from the reserve, which we will update throughout the year. So, for those unfamiliar with wetlands, essentially they are, well, wet. No way! (laughs) Wetlands are special ecosystems where land and water meet, but what typically confuses people is that wetlands do not always have standing water. Oh yeah, because then we could actually easily identify the habitat. Exactly. They can be continuously wet, periodically flooded, or exist where the soil is just hypersaturated, but where you can't actually see the surface water. These hydric soils support specifically adapted plants that can grow in very wet environments. You can identify a wetland by looking for these key plants and animals that live in them. In Georgia, we have about 5.3 million acres of wetlands. Wow, that's about 13% of Georgia's total land mass. Yes, and they are not just found on the coast. There are mountain seeps and bogs as well as bottomland wetlands and many other type of wetland habitat types. Since this is a coastal science podcast, though, we will be mainly referring to the coastal Georgia wetlands, which mostly exist of salt marsh with some areas of brackish waters. On Georgia's coast alone, there are over 400,000 acres of marsh. They are essential habitat to important species, but more importantly to humans, they are valuable. Like monetarily valuable. Yep. They are worth more than just the land that they occupy. Wetlands provide many ecosystem services, and when you factor them in, they often make the wetlands more valuable than just the stated land value. This can cause issues when developers unknowingly purchase wetlands for construction. They are then obligated to do what is called mitigation, which is where authorities permit them to build on a site designated as a wetland habitat by promising to preserve habitat elsewhere or by creating new habitat on the existing property. And while this is a good idea in theory, often mitigation does not correctly occur. Wetlands are filled in and the existing landscape is completely changed. This is because the hydrology of the entire surrounding area can be affected, meaning that water is not absorbed correctly back into the landscape like it once did. Also, land that, quote, makes up for wetland loss is not always an equal exchange. The specific habitat of a wetland might be negated, but the hydrology is not. Understanding how water flows through the land and the ecosystem is a very important factor when considering wetland mitigation and issues for permits for wetland disturbance. Also, making sure an environmental assessment is done before construction begins is not always a top priority, though it should be. Neighboring communities, local wildlife populations, and your home's foundation can be at risk if a survey is not thoroughly completed to determine the hydrology of an area. So why is hydrology important to wetlands? I mean, wetlands are defined by having a lot of water. Don't they contribute to the flooding? That's a very common question, since most people assume that wetlands are worsening their flooding, when really it's the exact opposite. Wetlands are essentially sponges. The plants and animals that exist in a wetland help to absorb the surrounding water and filter out bacteria and harmful runoff. The water infiltrates into surrounding areas, making local soils healthier and more plant-friendly, while also quickly dissipating floodwaters. The benefits that a wetland gives humans are called the ecosystem services. That's right. These are the services that bring a lot more value to wetlands than just land value. Some examples of the ecosystem services from wetlands are filtration, providing goods like food and medicine, reducing harmful greenhouse gases from our atmosphere, creating culturally important skills, and providing wildlife habitat, flood prevention, and recreational opportunities. These services contribute to our economy, not just our ecosystems. In fact, the Economic Value of Wetland Ecosystem Services, or WES, W-E-S, per hectare has been ranked first among all kinds of natural ecosystems in a 2019 study. 
The value of the West is expected to be just over 47% of the total value of the global ecosystem. That is an insanely high number for something that people tend to give little thought to, especially considering that sea level rise, extreme storms, and most importantly, human activities have reduced the area of global wetlands by about 35% between 1970 and 2015. This led to a significant reduction in the overall value of the West. Just to give you an idea of the impact of this decline in wetlands, the decreased marsh west value was $9.9 trillion per year from 1997 to 2011. Wait, wait, wait. Trillion with a T? Yep. Trillion. This is equivalent to 1.4 times China's gross domestic product in 2011. Protecting our wetlands is undeniably important to our economic security. The destruction of wetlands will result in massive economic losses. However, the current trends that direct human impacts have on coastal west values is poorly monitored, especially in emerging regions where wetland changes are escalating due to rapid urbanization and industrialization. Since the majority of the west is not directly exchanged in the economic market, the importance of wetland habitats is often overlooked or ignored by owners, government, and the general public. If more people truly understood the resources in the wetlands, they would never be filled or reduced. You may be asking, how could they possibly contribute that much to our economy? Well, wetlands act as energy and nutrient storage houses. Most plants in this environment are extremely efficient at capturing the sun's energy and storing it as a carbohydrate. This stored energy is the foundation of the food chain. Wetlands provide food, water, shelter, and nesting grounds for many different species of plants and animals. Birds, both migratory and year-round residents, endangered species both big and small, reptiles, my favorite, the frog, and of course fish utilize the wetlands for both homes, grocery stores, and nurseries. We then are provided with the direct economic resources of food, recreation, and tourism. But wetlands also provide indirect values such as climate and natural hazard mitigation. Like we mentioned, wetlands have flood mitigation properties. But did you know that wetlands can also increase your property value? Most people love the wetlands of the coast and enjoy their beauty. So wetlands are seen as a positive amenity, meaning a higher sale rate and increased price. Now, that doesn't mean that people won't change their tune when a wetland on their property suddenly inconveniences their plants. It is important to find a balance between maintaining a healthy ecosystem and human needs. Understanding the wetlands themselves is a complicated process, as historically, wetlands expand their areas during very rainy years. Their expansion is offset by the encroachment of upland plants during the dry years, however. Nature can sometimes control the changeover to upland species by fire. Fire encourages the regrowth of the native habitats. Now, all this makes predicting wetland migration very difficult. Wetlands are not static ecosystems. Their composition or makeup varies with the amount of available water. And humans don't tend to abide by Mother Nature. Humans have evolved over the years to remain stationary in their habitats by forming permanent residents that don't always agree with Mother Nature's plans. When you are building a home and choose a spot, know that even though it is not a wetland now, that doesn't mean that a nearby wetland could not expand into your territory in the future. This can be a very scary prospect for many homeowners. Now, you can build on a wetland just as long as they do not fall under federal jurisdiction pursuant to the Clean Water Act, but that doesn't mean you won't be fighting an uphill battle. When wetlands are filled, the water that makes them wet has to go somewhere. If you are building on these lands, you have to consider that your home or business may be damaged by this water in the future, especially given sea level rise and climate issues. The best chance to avoid these type of situation is to always conduct an environmental assessment on a home before purchasing it. Wetland biologists can determine your risk for flooding due to inland wetlands or rising tidal wetlands. These wetland delineations tell you precisely where a wetlands location is within your project plan. The Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, has several programs in place to safeguard wetlands in the United States. So we've got a little background on a few of the laws that we have regarding wetlands. Wetlands are protected by Section 404 of the Clean Water Act and Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act, which is why wetland permits are often referred to as Section 10-404 permits. 
Section 401 of the Clean Water Act also gives states the authority to issue a water quality certification for any project that requires a federal permit to ensure that the project will not violate state water quality standards. To obtain a permit for impacting a wetland, the delineated wetland boundary must be approved by the local and federal regulatory authorities and often other local agencies, including nonprofits, that may have a say in how and when the construction occurs by submitting public comments. So how can you help protect these vitally important ecosystems near you? You can participate in programs that help protect and restore wetlands by contacting local, state, or federal agencies community groups, environmental organizations, and other non-government organizations. Coastal Resources Division in Brunswick is a great example of this. They do oyster shell bagging periodically and other projects that rely on volunteer involvement. You can also report illegal actions such as unauthorized wetland fill or dredging activities to government authorities such as the U.S. EPA or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Coastal Resource Division of the Georgia DNR. A vital way to help wetlands is to also pick up litter and dispose in appropriate trash containers. Keep surface areas that wash into storm drains clean from pet waste, toxic chemicals, fertilizers, and motor oil, which can eventually reach and impair our wetlands, is another important step. Along the same line, using phosphate-free laundry and dishwasher detergents can prevent pollution. Phosphates encourage algae growth which can suffocate aquatic life by overstimulating the algae in what is known as an algal bloom. Use paper and recycled products that are made without bleach, as bleach paper contains toxic chemicals that can also contaminate water. Using non-toxic products for household cleaning and lawn care in general is not only a good practice to keep your home eco-friendly and pet safe, but also protects the wetlands. Never spray lawn and garden chemicals outside on a windy day or on a day that it might rain, as these chemicals can be washed into waterways that then feed into our local wetlands and estuaries. Surprisingly, most people do not think the plants in their yard affects neighboring wetlands, but using native species when planting trees, shrubs, and flowers helps to preserve the ecological balance of local wetlands and avoid invasive species that wreak havoc on local populations of plants and animals. You can also use living shoreline techniques that make use of plant roots to stabilize soil if you own waterfront property. This can help to stabilize a shoreline or riverbank instead of doing what is called hard armoring or installing bulkheads that can lead to further erosion and prevents wetlands from naturally migrating. Some other obvious ways are to avoid wetlands if you're expanding your home or planning any future construction. Enjoy the scenic and recreational opportunities that coastal wetlands offer, but be sure to preserve their integrity for future generations by minimizing the use of heavy equipment and staying in designated visitor areas where available. When boating, overwaking of shorelines and sensitive marsh areas contribute to the decline, so please use a reasonable speed that does not create a wake in posted no-wake zones. Even if you do not see an obvious reason for the zone, it could be there to protect habitat. Yes, protecting habitat protects the food web. Which brings me to an important question, Brittany. What do animals that live in the wetlands eat for dessert? I don't know. What? Marshmallows. Wow. I mean, that kind of ties into my question, though. What is a frog's favorite place to eat? I don't know. Where? (laughs) IHOP. Well, let's see if the listener questions are a bit more productive. I have a wet area in my neighborhood, right next to my backyard, on my neighbor's plot. It is just a breeding ground for mosquitoes, and they refuse to fill it in. What can I do to make him drain it? I need these mosquitoes gone without using a bunch of toxic chemicals. Well, for one thing, it is a very common misconception that I often hear. Healthy, functional wetlands do not create mosquito habitat. It is actually quite the opposite. Ephemeral wetlands or temporary wetlands are home to tons of frogs and other animals that emerge when the water table reaches optimal hatching levels. These species heavily reduce the mosquito populations. Mosquito control programs will sometimes recommend that wetlands be drained to control mosquito populations since mosquitoes need standing water for breeding. So the thought is if there's no water, there's no mosquitoes, right? Well, not quite when you think about a mosquito's short life cycle. That doesn't really make sense. Certain species have a lifespan of anywhere from four days to a month, with almost all species having a larval stage that can be dormant for over a year. 
Therefore, even after a wetland has been drained, or any area for that matter, it can still hold enough water over that year of dormancy to breed mosquitoes. And a drained area can produce even more mosquitoes than before because now it no longer has the animals that control the mosquitoes living in it. Now, notice I said healthy wetlands, not standing water. Standing water is an issue, and there is a difference between standing water and a wetland. Standing water can occur in old tires, cans, containers, hollow logs, and even small low spots in the ground where water pools. These places are way preferable for a mosquito than an actual wetland, since there are no predators in that area for their larvae. Encouraging dragonflies, damselflies, water striders, back swimmers, diving beetles, frogs, fish, and insect-eating birds to take up residence near your home and your wetland is a far more effective control method. You can learn more about creating these specific habitats at the link in our description. There are also non-toxic products you can place in your wet areas to discourage mosquitoes without harming other plants and animals. Mosquito dunks are inexpensive and easy ways to discourage larval infestations. They are small discs you can purchase online or at your local hardware store that contain a bacterium that targets mosquito larva specifically, and it's fast acting and dissolves quickly. They can be used in almost any aquatic habitat with no restrictions. These are not permanent solutions, you have to use them regularly, but they are a great alternative to toxic chemicals and are eco-friendly, cheap, and effective. For more information about any of the topics we covered today or to submit your question that may be featured in our upcoming episodes, please email us at signer.socials at gmail.com. That's S-I-N-E-R-R dot socials at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Sapelo Nerds, a coastal science podcast brought to you by the Sapelo Island National Estuarine Research Reserve. Please check back for more episodes released on the 1st and the 15th of each month. And that's the Savalo Sound.